Hello, hello. Can you all hear me okay? Good, good evening. And welcome to the Brooklyn Museum and thank you for joining us tonight for our tribute to the great Virgil Abloh. I'm Ann Pasternak and I always say I'm the lucky gal that gets to be the director of the Brooklyn Museum. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Before we dive into this evening's conversation, let us come together and take a collective moment to acknowledge that we are currently located on land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware Nations. At the Brooklyn Museum, we recognize and honor the Lenape Delaware Nations, their elders, and all future generations. We are committed toward addressing erasures of indigenous people and confronting ongoing legacies of settler colonialism in our work. Thank you. Now, I am joined on stage by American Sign Language interpreters, Alberto Madero and also Johnny. Is, are you Johnny? Hi, Johnny. Cole. Where's Johnny? Oh, you're Johnny and you're Alberto? I should have asked beforehand. Welcome. <laughs> There are seats reserved in the front rows on the left side of the audience for those who are viewing virtually through Zoom. One of our interpreters will be visible throughout the program and there's an also an option to turn on closed captioning. And please, please direct messages to us if we can support with navigating captioning in any way whatsoever. Now let me say that tonight's program and Virgil's exhibit would not have been possible without the grace of the Ablo family and I want to thank Shannon Ablo, the hard work and integrity of his team, especially the very brilliant Mafuz, Francesco, Athi, everyone at Alaska, Alaska, as well as the originating curatorial vision of Michael Darling, who organized the original show, uh, Figures of Speech, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Did any of you see that show? A few of you? Okay and our own curator extraordinaire, Antoine Sargent. So on behalf of the entire Brooklyn Museum family, we thank all of you for your significant role in this exhibition, and we also want to thank our presenting sponsor, Nordstrom. And before I introduce our speakers, allow me to say a few words about dear Virgil. Virgil was a visionary who saw his practice as a conceptual art practice that would leave a mark on just about every artistic discipline imaginable, from fashion and architecture, film and design, and music to poetry and painting. For Virgil, being an artist represented freedom. And as our show demonstrates, he refused to let his practice be put in a proverbial box. His Creativity was just too big to contain, just like his energy. And when you look at the scope of his work in his all too short life, it's really astonishing. I can't think of another artist who worked so brilliantly with so many creative industries. And every time he played with conventions and he flipped them on their head, he brought new light and spirit to things that were really familiar and he imbued all that he did with an insistent celebration of black culture and black excellence. And he never quit on his standards of excellence, nor did he ever waste a moment. He was driven to be a force of good, especially in kicking open the gates of powerful brands to reach as many people, but in particular, as many BIPOC youth as he could so that they too would know that they would have far greater opportunities to create culture, to own their own work, and to shape our society, which we really need. Of the many themes in figures of speech, Virgil's passion for collaboration and community stand out. He worked with famous people, and he worked with youth who were completely unknown alike. And he did so with the same passion and joy and integrity. And tonight we are really honored to bring together two of his favorite creative partners, Tawanda Chueche and Tremaine Emery, in conversation with Antoine Sargent. 
So let me tell you just a little bit about each of them. Tawanda is the creative director of Alaska Alaska, and he has worked on a broad range of Virgil's projects since the firm's inception, informing the creative and de design development. His cross-disciplinary interests are emblematic of his studio's output within the disciplines of graphic design, product design, architecture, art, and of course, their intersections. Tawanda has led and assisted notable projects that include collaborators such as Nike, Vitra, Mercedes-Benz, Baccarat, Off-White, Evian, Alessi, and a whole lot more. We also have the great Tremaine Emery, founder of Denim Tears, who has forged a fast-growing reputation as an agent, agent provocateur and countercultural catalyst. Amplified through his creative playground called no, Vac no Vacancy Inn. Where does he come up with these ideas? His ability to widen the cultural lexicon through collaborations centered on contemporary art have become cultural touchstones of our times. And it should be no surprise that Supreme urged him to be their creative director. Like Tawanda, Tremaine has also worked with enviable list of collaborators, including, of course, Virgil, yay, the Astor Gates, Hank Willis Thomas, go Brooklyn, Frank Ocean, Andre 3000, and many others. And then of course, we have Antoine Sargent, independent curator, art critic, a writer who has contributed to the New York Times, the New Yorker, Vice, and more. He has recently contributed essays and interviews to museum and gallery books for artists Ed Clark, Nicolene Thomas, Arthur Jaffa, Yinku Shinabari, and his own first book, I'm sure you've all seen it, and if you haven't, you must get it, The New Black Vanguard, Photography Between Art and Fashion. It's great. So without further ado, please join me in giving a Brooklyn welcome to Tawanda, Tremaine, and Antoine. And again, thank you for being here. Good evening. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, for um, a conversation um, about Virgil and collaboration um, in art. I wanted to sort of just get right into it and sort of start with a question um, that I've been asked a lot over the last few days, um, and that's how did you guys come to know Virgil? Uh, if I could start. Um, so I was able to just guess Virgil's email address. Uh, <laughs> at a time in which, you know, <clears throat> in hindsight, that was the craziest thing we could have done because, yeah, email and Virgil do not necessarily go hand in hand. Uh, so <laughs> Virgil replied two days later. Um, yeah, he just replied two days later. I remember sort of waking up in a tiny bit of shock. Uh, tried to schedule some, it was Skype back then, not Zoom. Uh, and then before you know it, he threw me in a group chat um, and then we just sort of, uh, a dialogue started. And then, um, yeah, at some point he said, uh, I've got us a real project, our first real project. Um, and then that's when he gave the IKEA brief. Um, and the studio sort of been rolling since. Um, so yeah, that's how I met him. Quite a first project. Yes. <laughs> um, I first, met Virgil, I think, I met him, I was, it's gonna be hard to believe, I was modeling, walking in a fashion show for um, Pigal, and um, he was um, at the show, he had on a baby blue Pyrex, Pyrex hoodie, and um, we kind of did like the black guy had nod to each other. And then um, there was an after party at this club that used to exist that was run by a guy named Sharaf called Pom Pom. And yeah, he came up to me and was like, you from Brooklyn, right? And I was like, nah, Queens. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he bought me a drink. That's how we met. And for the both of you, when you sort of, after those initial you know, interactions or those initial meetings, how did, did you become collaborators with the? <clears throat> Dialogue. Um, 
uh, just dialogue. I think is it especially given how much of a sort of traveling nomad he is, you know, it's it was just a constant communication. Uh, he, he's always had that capacity to be present um, and speak to multiple people. So at least um, in reference to my um, uh, yeah engagement with him, it was just dialogue, 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 uh, exchanging ideas, uh, thinking through problems or finding solutions. Um, dialogue, yeah. What made you want, so you said you reached out, you guessed his email, what sort of drove you to sort of make that gesture or to want to reach out to a creative like that? Exactly. At least for me, it was just observing his approach. So I'd always been aware of his work, even when he was sort of working with Ye um, at the time. And for me, it was just his capacity to contextualize or collaborate artists. So for example, I think even seeing some of those early, you know, watch the throne with the implication of Ricardo TC's involvement or working with Vanessa Beecroft and various, you know, just seeing Virgil actualize his eye. Um, and then obviously as he evolves into contextualizing his own projects, I remember specifically, even before I sent that e email, what triggered it was um, the work he had done at um, Art Basel, his first furniture um, display. And there was just things that I was seeing that sort of didn't make sense. Uh, so for example, all the other booths, the lighting source would always come from the top. Uh, just these various gestures. Um, and his light source was coming from the side. He had a parquet floor. Things that just didn't make sense. So then I could see he was trying to do something in a very specific space and was thinking through design decisions in a, in a way that just completely attracted me. Um, so then, yeah, at least for me, that was that spark. And Tremaine, how did you sort of go from sort of dialogue or meeting to collaborating? We collaborated from our first, so you know, that, that meeting at the Pagal show and the after party was, that made us associates, you know, friendly associates. We weren't friends, and, but we had mutual friends, some good mutual friends. And um, there's a guy named, there's a, there was a restaurant bar called La Bodega Negro that I worked for my mentor, at the, uh, friend and mentor, Serge Becker, and I was the social director, put on parties, um, hired DJs, whatever stuff there. So it was a new, new hot spot in London, and a guy named Kyle Demers, who at the time was working for Supreme, he's currently the CEO of Supreme now, but this was about 12 years ago. And um, 10 years ago, and Kyle hit me up and said, hey, you know Virgil? I'm like, yeah, I know, we got some mutual friends. We're both in town, we're looking to have a drink. Can you get us into that, that surge's spot? I said, yeah, I'll call down. And then um, I get, and then Kyle's like, why don't you come down and have a drink? So I come down there with A-Side, because A-Side and Virgil had known each other for a while through Virgil's cousin, Tony Togo. And then also the work that A-Side did with Nike, Kanye and Virgil and Don and all those guys on the Yeezy ones. Anyway, me and A-Side go down there, meet V and Kyle, and we're kicking it, talking, 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 talking. And, um, that night, you know, V is such a romantic in a way, because he was like, I told the story of when I was 20 years old and I was trying to book Kanye to do a, Kanye did a party in Queens, like a, a show, and no one showed up. So I was like, I know everyone. If I do one, everyone will show up. This is before College Dropout came out. So my man Ferris gave me Don C's number. I called Don, Don's like, yeah, who's this? I'm like, yo, it's Tremaine, blah, blah, blah. He's like, oh, we can't, we can't work out. So I told Virgil this whole story, and Virgil just said to me, well, I guess you're gonna finally get your party this week. And I didn't know what he meant. It was super kind of cryptic. And then a few days later, V was like, let's do a party together. Me, you, and A-side. Let's do it at Bodega. So this is our first collaboration. And um, he's like, we'll do it after Ye's show. I can't go to the show. I had a dinner, Mark Jacobs' dinner. A-side had to work at Bodega and DJ. 
And um, V sent another cryptic message. He said, bring an aux cord. Know why you need it, whatever. And then, um, yeah, we proceeded to do a party. And, um, you know, it was incredible. And I remember Ye played demos of uh, Yeezus. And, um, yeah, Virgil just winked at me. <laughs> you know, there was a moment where he looked at me and he just like kind of winked, like, I got you. You know what I mean? So that was our, our first collaboration. And then from then on, as you can see, there's an artwork where um, he's digitized all the party flyers. Me and Aesod are on some of them. So our first way of working with Virgil was music, DJing parties, creating par parties to socialize the idea of who we were, what our culture is, what our scene, our tribe is. And we did these parties all around the world. And for a while, we did them for no money. We just did it because we loved it. You know, I remember times I'd be consulting for a hotel and book Virgil a economy ticket from Chicago. He'd fly in for one day, get paid 500 bucks. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, that was how we first started collaborating was music, parties, me, A-Side Virgil, Benji B, Guillaume Berg, um, and a few other people on our little rogue squadron. So the, that's the first collaboration was doing parties. And the first one was um, 2012, 2013 at La Bodega Negra. Music was such a important sort of inspiration, but also um, sort of something that helped to sort of um, aesthetically sort of order um, his universe. Can you talk a little bit about um, the significance of music on his practice as an artist? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's how, that night, that's how we first connected, because um, he started talking about, do you know Benji B? I've been listening to his radio, sh radio show every week for 10 years. And that's when I knew, I said, this guy's deep. <laughs> if you're, you know what I mean? Like, this is pre-gram, for anything, you're going on BBC, iPlayer, and listening weekly to Benji B's show. I never met no one that was American that listened to the show religi religiously. I was the only person that listened to it sometimes that I knew because we used to listen to it at Mark Jacobs sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, that's how we all bonded. He's utterly obsessed with music, you know? And all the things around music because music has all the things. It has performance art, static art. Um, it, has, it has history. It has future in it, it has the moment in it, it has rebellion in it, it has um, love in it, sex, everything's in music. The whole entire human condition is in three minutes and 20 seconds, or a, uh, an 18 minute symphony is in music. And um, people who, who understand that become obsessed with it. And Virgil is one of those people. So probably one of the most important parts of his art practice was his love, understanding, and quest for music. Yeah. Tawanda, um, we worked together, you know, on the exhibition, um, increasingly so, um, or it became increasingly sort of visible um, that you guys were working on the show, right? Um, uh, um, after um, V passed, for you, the com you know, it was also very clear that we were having certain conversations and you guys were having certain conversations. Um, for you, what was sort of the, the, the brief, if you will, um, for Alaska, Alaska in relationship to um, helping organize figures of speech, um, the exhibition? Well, at least, uh, you know, the dialogue we were having with Virgil regarding the exhibition, you know, started ages ago, um, towards even uh, 2019, mm -hmm. uh, even pre-pandemic, um, you know, and the tone of the show was always supposed to be sort of the way it materialized. Um, it was always supposed to be more, more austere, uh, the introduction of tables and sort of a, the sculptural house that is within the central space. Um, you know, all of those things had always been in the intention and um, Virgil was additionally working on additional names or sub names, um, you know, black minimalism was on the cutting room floor, uh, six works. Uh, the sunroof of the Trojan horse, um, uh, various gestures um, because he he wanted something different for Brooklyn, knowing that the lineage of how this show has always been. 
Um, and so in reference to that, yeah, for us, it was just more so knowing where we were within the process, taking those blueprints and running forward, um, trying to maintain those aspects that had been extremely consistent uh, within the ideation process and the, um, the state in which he left the project. Um, so for us, yeah, it was doing more, um, but doing the same work we've been doing uh, in dialogue, so. Do you have a, a favorite collaboration that you guys worked on um, as Alaska, Alaska? No, uh, and I don't mean no in a bad way, uh, because for, you know, Virgil's prolific. Uh, whenever my colleagues, or uh, whenever people would ask me and my colleagues, what are you working on? We would almost just look at each other and just not know what to say. Uh, and I think sort of like, you know, at some point, you know, we save all of our work, we've, you know, we've got everything within the files and there's too many things to count. Mm -hmm. And it's almost feels more appropriate to surmise the whole, you know. Um, you know, we, we would enter projects and then enter another project. And while I'm tired of another project, I'm running away to another project. And it's mostly about uh, maintaining um, and surfing different types of design objectives. Um, so it, at least for me, there isn't necessarily a favorite project, but it's, it's about the format. You know, Virgil would always talk about, you know, things in, in, in you know, he, he coined this term um, contemporary landscapes, uh, which he would sort of use to contextualize what it means to sort of surf between different contexts you know, from let's say, our Basel to Mykonos, uh, and all of these various things. So then for us, in terms of projects, it's that capacity surf between corporate to small scale to pro bono, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, for me, it's, it's very difficult to say. Um, yeah. one, of the, one of the things that I found interesting in sort of working um, on the show for the last two years or two and a half years was that it was always about the idea, right? It wasn't necessarily about like a product or a finished product, right? It was always about like, I have this idea, right? And I just need to get the idea out. Yeah, go ahead, no, um, yeah, go ahead. Someone told me a story. I think it was Ben Trill, oh, Justin Saunders told me the story. And it was Ben Trill days and someone there in New York mobbing around and someone said, yo, we never got our shirt. And Virgil said, we sell ideas. <laughs> it was the idea we sold you. Don't worry about the shirt. Right. <laughs> but that, I mean, that, that's amazing. Um, I got stories. <laughs> um, and that, you know, that like there was a book, the Black Canyon book, right? And the story that Mafuz told um, about that book was like, they were just, throwing images, right, in WhatsApp. And it's like, we need to make this a book. They made a book. There are three copies that exist. Mafuz has one, Virgil has one, Arthur Jaffa has one, right? And for me, like, what that um, symbolized, right, was, was really about, like, the, when you talked about sort of creative exchanges or dialogues, it was sort of like he was having a, when he had dialogue with friends or fellow artists, that was about their dialogue, right? And the objects that came out of those um, dialogues um, didn't have to be commercial, right? They didn't have to live in the world um, at a, you know, a shop or, you know, a museum, but it could have lived just among those, those people in dialogue. Exactly. Like, you know, to the capacity where, you know, um, I don't remember who I was talking about just, but almost just coming to terms in reference to just the way he navigated life, um, the degrees in which, you know, the separation between either work or leisure or all of these boundaries or, or things that categorize in terms of, yeah, uh, how you navigate lives. And I think that's part and parcel of why all dialogue or all friendships had output and yep. the output didn't have to mean anything or it didn't have to be commercial to your point. It didn't have to, because it was just a point of entry into dialogue with people, you know, it's, it's fascinating, like. No, he was, he was um, genius at so many things. 
but he's a genius at that because just you know how the Black Canyon book was made you know I remember I was just posting on Instagram um, particularly men most some women who were older with great style and who hadn't given up their gumption on life they're still artists they didn't let life beat them down and I called it art dad me and Aesod so I was just posting and then Ace and Virgil started up a group chat and said yo this is genius we're gonna do a collection. Six months later, art that no vacancy in collab with Off Whites walking down a runway in Paris off of a group text. Mm -hmm. That's genius. And he was the first person since my father to tell me that everything was art. When I was a kid, my dad always said to me, Tremaine, I'll be brushing my teeth. There's art to brushing your teeth. I'll be cutting the lawn. There's art to cutting the lawn. You know what I mean? So like, I'd be like, shut up. And then, <laughs> You know, 15 years later, I met a guy who was saying the same thing to me. I, I'll never forget another off of Instagram. And that's the thing. What people saw tri as trite or meaningless, Virgil saw value in. I was posting all this, like, I guess my current archive of clothing and then objects, ephemera, all this stuff, just wasting time on Instagram. And then he sent me an email. He goes... Um, I'd like you to contribute your practice to this auction that I'm doing for Paddle, which was an auction site. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way he spoke to me in the email changed my life. He didn't say all oh, that cool stuff. He said, your practice. He made me see myself in a way I never seen myself with words, with conviction, with intention, in a way that no one in the vicinity of fashion, designer, art, would address me. That's V. Yeah. And, you know, like, to, I think, to that point, you know, like, some of the, I think we planned this show maybe eight times. I mean, it, it was, and if it, if we had more time, would have probably planned it eight more times, you know, because he was one of those people that you just could not, you'd be like, so he, this is the show, right? And he's like, a week later, well, what about this, right? And to your point about you know, what, what he would say would be like, yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> It took me a while to and figure the, out what that the, meant. The exactly. number of E's, yeah. A's and H's, you, it was like a gradation of what that, yeah, yeah. You got the short yeah, it was a rap. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, it did take me a while to figure out, to sort of decode that. Um, but he, he wanted, I mean, he wanted to significantly reduce this show. I mean, it, it is sort of one third of the objects that um, had been traveling and I that's so funny because you were having that come you guys were having that you know dialogue I remember at one point there was a conversation about like 15 objects in the museum just like 15 of them and I was like Anne's gonna have a heart attack and um, <laughs> this is a survey I don't know if we're gonna you know and but it's it's what was sort of like interesting and what struck me about that um, was that he was always trying to just even push himself right like um, beyond what you know an expectation was right people had um, you know their views on him right he was a you know a lot of people were, he's a fashion designer why don't you have more clothes why aren't they, you know and what was sort of super interesting um, to me was that like as much output that he was you know clearly making um, is that he was still an artist on a journey right and it, in, in the show I wanted to sort of show that right and show the the way that like, you know, in some ways, you know, at 41 or you know, 39, I think when we started this show, is that he was still sort of asking questions and sort of seeking answers, mm -hmm. right? And that sort of organized every WhatsApp message or exchange that we had was just rooted in that. And so um, even with Tremaine that shared, like I was doing this thing on Instagram, then he made a WhatsApp group, you know? Mm -hmm. Like even our conversation started about an exhibition and then I'm being like, oh, you did that photo book. I'm looking for a photographer this age, this, you know, like, and so it was like all of these sort of, um, like there was just like no, it was like a deep fluidity that sort of happened. In no, and, and that's why it's sort of like, a, you know, I, I reduced the conversation to the way he approached life, you know, and I think for, for me, that's where the practice is. Um, you know, the, the, there was never a rock left unturned. You know, we, you mentioned the DJ flyer works. You know, for me, that's, that's practice. Mm -hmm. That's all of those flyers, the iterative, you know, uh, approach to something like that, for me, was just conducive to 
an approach of always seeing. Um, you know, one thing <coughs> that we realize within a creative process is, you know, let's just say we're in dialogue uh, and we do something, and then he just wants to change it by a centimeter. And it's, and it's almost like, but, but that's so insignificant for you. Like, do you want to change it? And it's like, no, just a centimeter over there. And for me, that was sort of like the implication of his touch um, always inserting himself into the equation because that was his artistry. You know, he, he touched everything that he did. Um, and yeah, for me, um, that's the approach. Um, the approach is really that innovation to me. Yeah, that, it's sort of interesting because you, you talk about that, and we had this. I mean, you had this conversation. We're doing this walkthrough, and it's about the, the his sort of language around tourists versus purists, right? And so how he's trying to sort of, and it's not a high low, right? It's mm -hmm. not sort of a hierarchical thing. I don't think he even believed in hierarchy in that way. Exactly. Um, but it was sort of this idea that like the touch could be for the purists, or the touch could be for the tourists, right? And can you talk about sort of how that helped to sort of organize um, his practice as an artist and like the way, like the gestures, right? Because I think a lot of people sort of confused a lot of the gestures that he, you know, made um, artistically. Exactly. No, it really is, you know, it's about points of entry, you know, the, the, the capacity to speak to multiple people at once. Um, and for, for, for that specific, you know, the, the innovation of the tourist and purist just sort of enabled that. It's such a almost reductive but almost spectral turn of phrase in terms of how much it encompasses uh, within the range of the tourist and the purist, you know, the people who are there to just sort of understand, find out and inquire and sort of like the implications of the opposite, which is um, a purist who is more sort of focused, disciplined and precise. And so just to occupy space with that medium and that range um, enables multiple dialogues to transpire at once. Uh, and this is sort of, yeah, uh, for, for me, this was a, a genius of a hack, you know, just to be able to sort of consume and consolidate more through his practice um, with those different mechanisms. You know, if, if, even when people reference the 3%, it was more so in reference to, you know, he spoke of the idea of advertisement a lot and even stuff like that just, um, you know, it, it's why he would always try and work with brands that are the best in class. We're talking, it's the, it's the idea of communication. It's not the idea that it's popular or this, it's communication. It's, it's the billboard. Um, so yeah, oh, a, a lot of these terminologies, a lot of these um, uh, approaches within his practice um, were for very specific intentions, basically. One uh, another thing that, that was also sort of a key um, component of who he was as an artist was how much he could get away with, right? <laughs> what was sort of for both of you one of the best things you guys sort of like got away with in terms of like pushing um, sort of, you know, the sort of space to where you wanted it to be and, and you just sort of said, I can't believe we did that shift. Meaning like, you know, there's a work in the exhibition on the DJ flyers, the flat white flyers, um, where he just took the UN logo, right? And just started put, using it at, as his DJ logo, right? And then the UN um, wrote him a cease and desist letter. Um, and then every country had to sign the cease and desist letter, right? And then he framed it and in turn a work of art, right? It was about sort of getting away with that. There's also the story, the great story um, that he told me about cotton ink, right? Like the cotton sign, right? Which he then turns into um, a painting um, and then it sort of sits it high enough so um, it becomes um, almost like an ad, right? It sort of functions like, like an ad. So what is something that you guys sort of um, collaborate with him on that you sort of like, I can't believe we actually pulled that off? <laughs> um, Youth before beauty. Uh, <laughs> so, so, like for me, I, I probably can't verbalize in public space some of the stuff okay. we've got away fair. with. Fair, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the stuff I really want to say I won't. But mm -hmm. you know, for me, yeah, it was it was always funny the 
the specific considerations he would make about specific things. For, so for example, uh, in dialogue with the graphic designer at our studio, Virgil would always ask uh, the team to sort of image trace logos instead of requesting the actual files for <laughs> it was just image traces. So it just almost messes up that logo a tiny bit. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure on some of the t-shirts you're wearing mm -hmm. with the Brooklyn Museum logo, I'll tell you that one, that was image traced. Uh, so in reference to that, these slight gestures or I don't know if they're sort of personal jokes or I, I don't know what it is, but it's intentional. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of that, there, there's a million things to say. But. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the greatest thing he got away with was becoming the artistic director of Louis Vuitton in an industry that is historically and right now systematically racist. Mm -hmm. So for him to be able to achieve that with poise and without anger and all the pushback he got from the fashion industry, the magazines, people on Twitter, Instagram, and to achieve that, it's the greatest magic trick. That's why he's the GOAT. No one else, no one else had the will or intention or love to, to achieve that. And now it's possible for everyone. I would not be creative director of Supreme if it wasn't for Virgil. I put that on my mama's grave. So that's, the, that's probably the greatest thing he got away with. Because if you do the odds, you do the odds, you becoming the first African American of Ghanaian descent, black man, becoming an artistic director of Louis Vuitton. What are the odds? And it's funny. You, um, <laughs> hey, um, uh, and, to, and to echo T's point, um, you know. I think, you know, Virgil left several titles for the show. And for us, you know, when we sort of started co-opting aspects of the sunroof of the, of the Trojan horse, you know, as a, as a tagline, I, I think we even made personal decision to start trying to push that title mm -hmm. and put it into the equation. So it's on some of the merchandise, it's on some of the stuff. And for us, the, the reason why we wanted to do that was largely in reference to the light or the, the, the way that we also saw him uh, and his his achievements and their, and like the consequences of his achievements and what it does you know the sunroof of a Trojan horse implicates hope you know it's the skylight you can see this you, you know you can see the sky you know there's hope and for us he he occupied space in a way that provided that um, so yeah uh, to absolutely echo to Tremaine's point. All right. There's, I'm going to ask two more questions, and we're going to open it up for, um, for questions from the audience. And so if you have questions, um, there will be microphones on each end. Um, the first question is, why do you think he sort of, you know, artists sort of operate in all of these different ways and make, you know, choices, right, um, in their um, practices that sort of organ, or orders those practices, right? One for him was collaboration, right? Why do you think that he was so drawn to um, collaboration? I would say for me, um, it, it goes back to sort of like not drawing the line somewhere, um, which is why sort of when I, when I was implicating work, play, uh, and sort of even making no distinctions there, I think collaboration is an opportunity to sort of get somewhere you wouldn't get on your own. Um, and uh, the, the, the implication of exchanging or literally going further than you could than one can on their own um so for me it it has a lot of credence in that it's it's um it's sort of like a a tool to sort of navigate build um it's it's actually just humanity um truth be told yeah yeah took the words out of my mouth um yeah i think he was obsessed i think let's speak about him specifically but any truly great artist or just great human beings mimic, um, or not even mimic, follow the rules of nature, which is collaboration, you know, how we get here, how, 
how things get built, how we were in tribal times to how we are now. When, when are things destructive? When people are narcissists, when they focus on their self, when a nation is personal on the self and forget everything else. When are things great? When are things blissful? When are they beautiful? When people are kind? What's, what's one of the pinnacles of kindness? Collaboration, giving to someone, someone giving to you. So I think Virgil understood that on a deeper level than just, you know, let's do this thing with Braun. He understood on um, esoteric level collaboration. And I think that's why he was obsessed with it and knew what came out of it. My other question is another question I've been getting sort of a lot, which is um, what do you think his legacy is or will be? Um, his family, his kids, and his Shannon and his, and his family. That's, to me, you know, um, that's the most important thing. All the art stuff, and it's, that's cool, but what makes it really dope is, yeah, how he was with his friends and family. Last time I saw him, he flew, he flew in to DJ a young black female's art um, show, Candace Williams, and he DJed her opening. And uh, it was really important to do that. And I said, why are you here? He's like, oh, this is just a pit stop to go um, take my kids trick-or-treating. <laughs> that was one of the last things he said to me. He said, I'm going to take the kids trick-or-treating. I saw him on the eve of Halloween, you know, and most, you know, I've been on around the world with him. He always um, take time, call Shannon. Um, they were, you know, always in contact and just, yeah, I learned, yeah, just, I know so many, I know so many people, powerful, famous people, and um, his friends and his family were, you know, a big concern to him, you know. Even like on my birthday, he sent me like these cotton flowers. And I was like, how does dude even find time to do that? Or even think to, you know? So that's his great lesson. It's like compassion and thoughtfulness in his family, for me. Yeah, for me, it's sort of, um, it goes back to that sort of uh, tagline, the sunroof of the Trojan horse. Uh, just yeah. the, the, the idea of hope. Um, he, he showed capacities to sort of do and, and mobilize and, and made it look easy. Um, so for it to look easy, I think it's uh, a point of entry to people in terms of um, seeing what's possible and what can happen. And so for me, that's the legacy perhaps. Perfect, I think we can um, leave it there. I wanted to thank you both for sharing. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, and um, to the conversation. And if you have a few minutes, I would love for you to go see the exhibition. Um, and Anne, are you gonna, I'm gonna turn over to Anne. So I just wanna um, tell you a lesson that I've learned working on this show. And it's a lesson I've learned again and again, and I'll be always blessed for that lesson. Always listen to great artists. And you know what I'm talking about. I learned a lot in this process. So all of you who love artists, all of you who work with artists, always listen to the great artists and follow them. I want to, um, we're all a little emotional, right? <laughs> I, w I want to um, thank Antoine, Tremaine, Tawanda for sharing with us their stories and their experiences and the inspiration of Virgil. And I want us all to give a big heartfelt Brooklyn love for Shannon and Virgil's parents and siblings and friends who are all here. Can we stand up and give them some love? Thank you for being here. That's what I'm talking about. That's Brooklyn Love.